All right, everyone, this is Bill Dodson. Uh, I am going to change our screen sharing. If our panelists will uh, turn their video and audio on, we'll get started today. Uh, first, a uh, couple of uh, little housekeeping items as we get started. I do wanna let you know that uh, you can ask questions of all of our panelists by using the Q&A feature at the bottom. Uh, you just click that and it comes in. I'll, I'll get those and depending on our flow, I will, I'll, I'll probably interrupt one of these ladies and um, bring it up if it seems like a very, very timely topic. And then the other thing is, um, if, if it's something that we wanna hold till the end, we'll hold that one. Uh, right now, uh, you should be able to he hear and see all of us. I've got every, everyone here. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Liz. Uh, with Commerce Lexington so we can get started for today. Thanks, Bill. Um, I want to welcome you all here today. I think we have a great crowd today, it looks like. Um, I think it's a topic that is very timely and unique to this. Um, it's not unique um, to all of our daily lives, but this has really thrown, thrown a lot of people for a loop and um, really affected our mental and physical health in a lot of ways. So I'm looking forward myself to seeing what these uh, ladies have to share, um, these very qualified uh, ladies, including our board member, Karen Hill. And we're really excited to have her here. And um, we've put together a great, or they've put together a great um, bunch of panelists for us. So one thing I want to mention, um, this week we did announce that the uh, Salute to Small Business Awards are, um, the applications are now open for that. Um, and so if you go to our, the Commerce Lexington website at uh, commercelexington.com and go under events, you'll be able to um, now nominate a business. Uh, we haven't had that in the past, but you can now nominate a business and we will contact them or you can apply your business on there. So um, we've changed the categories around a little bit this year um, to make it a little more inclusive, a little less redundant and easier for you all um, to apply online. So. If you, are, if you are a small business interested in that, it's 150 employees or less, um, then we would love to have you apply for that. So with that, I will hand it over to Bill and Debbie and get started. Great, well, thank you so much, Liz, and great reminder about the Small Business Salute, and hopefully we'll have lots of uh, nominees for that this year. So want to welcome you to, I believe, our eighth edition of the Four O'Clock Focus. So uh, my how time flies, but we hope that you guys have been finding the content relevant. I think that when Bill and I worked with Liz and Kelly to put together the presentation for today, we were really excited because we know that, you know, having local experts, we, we all hear the national news and we all hear kind of what's going on uh, throughout the country, but having local experts here in Lexington, Fayette and surrounding counties to help talk to us about current real-time health and wellness issues and things that we can do to take care of ourselves and help our employees take care of ourselves themselves I think is really relevant. So joining us today, we have Dr. Karen Hill. Uh, she is the COO and the CNO at Baptist Health. And as Liz said, a member of the uh, Commerce Lexington Board of Directors. So Karen is extremely well acquainted with, with a variety of professionals throughout the state. So she brought with us uh, Dr. Rachel Hovermail with EKU, who specializes in mental health and Dr. Dee Beckman, who is uh, also working at Baptist Health, and she is the Director of Outcomes, Process Excellence, and Institutional Review. She has a lot of great stats for us. So we thought what we would do is kind of what we've done in uh, past formats. We obviously encourage anybody to click the chat button and submit questions. These ladies are well ready for any questions, but I thought we'd start out and Dr. Hill, we'll start with you with just a little bit of an update in terms of your leadership role at Baptist Health. Can you give us an overview of what's changed the last few months in healthcare at the hospital specifically? I think everything's changed. You know, all of us knew from the CDC that there were issues with the potential outbreak of an infection in the winter time, in the January, February timeframe. Mm -hmm. But from uh, about early March on, when people started seeing incidents in the state, in the area, all of us changed everything. Um, all the hospitals were told by the governor and governors in many states that we needed to watch capacity uh, to make sure that we could take patients if they came in unpredicted. Uh, we were told that we needed to look at our supplies of personal protective equipment because uh, there's so many unknowns about how this virus was transmitted from one person to another. So we started looking at that much more intensely. Um, and then we were on the alert for patients with symptoms who would come into either our physician's offices or our emergency room, so everything changed. I think the one thing that hasn't changed in my whole career, and I've been a nurse 42 years, which is sort of hard to believe, 
But um, the one thing that hasn't changed is healthcare providers are always worried about infection control. It's something that's on the top of our mind. We want to make sure that people are safe. Um, hand hygiene, you know, those things have not changed. They've become more public knowledge. I know my grandkids talk about washing your hands a lot more than they used to. Um, but we, we still are watching for infections. We, could have, we just had to up our game a lot. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I can only imagine that with this kind of news and it all happening so quickly that your employees and staff have had some various reactions. Can you give us a little bit of insight as to, you know, how they've handled the, the changes and maybe things that you've implemented to, to help with ease, ease some of the restrictions or make the restrictions easier to follow? Absolutely. Um, one thing I appreciate is the camaraderie that we have with our healthcare team. Immediately in March, we started putting together a multidisciplinary team of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, administrators to deal with the issues because the issues are evolving all the time and, and continue to evolve. Um, we had daily calls with them because we wanted to try to stay on top of things as they changed, including sharing with them uh, to get their input on what practices did we need to implement at the hospital? How did we need to handle visitors? How do we need to handle patients? And those calls went for a period of about nine weeks. Now we do a weekly call in addition to that because things have slowed down a little bit as far as new information and changes, but the issues are still evolving. So that's one thing. Um, our staff have always been, I think, aware that any patient coming in or any patient encounter in a physician's office or any place else could be a potential source of infection to them. But I think their awareness is more now to protect themselves from their families because they're concerned. They go home at night to take care of their kids and their families and they don't want to take anything home. Dee and her department have done an immense amount of education for our staff as we have uh, changed the expectations for personal protective equipment. Our patients that take care of uh, the potential COVID patients or patients uh, that have been diagnosed with COVID, we're full body PPE. They are monitored to watch them take the uh, device, the equipment, the mask on and off. Um, and we've done a lot of education. We've had to buy a lot of equipment. Um, we've had to buy iPads for all of our units because when we stopped having visitors, we wanted to make sure that people were connected. And one of the best things that came out of this is we have great communication between an appointed family member and the nurse that's responsible for that patient and the doctor. And even now that we have visitors in the hospital, we still have that every day. And we have iPads all over the place. People FaceTime their relatives if they're not able to see them. Um, the one thing that I will tell you about our staff is that they tried to replace the, the support of family members as much as possible when they could, when people were not allowed to have families. And I'm just really proud of, of the compassion that they showed, even though they were afraid. So um, things have changed a lot. Well, that, that certainly means a lot to the families, and I'm going to touch back on that in a second, but something you mentioned uh, brings me over to Dr. Beckman, and I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on, you know, the mention of PPE and some of the uh, requirements around that and anything that you've seen with regard to, do we have a shortage of medical equipment or, or just your general feeling about the state of PPE? Well, I have to say a thank you um, to our mayor. Um, she is a nurse. <laughs> and we got a lot of folks together early on uh, when we first started becoming aware of COVID and the potential for it to move to the, what we thought was the eastern part of the country. We didn't know at the time that it, that it was actually coming through the eastern part of the country through New York. And so uh, we actually have a weekly call with the acute facilities in Fayette County and talk about PPE and talk about um, beds and capability uh, of moving patients around if or when we, we hit that surge. We have also been very fortunate um, that we're in a system that has that tried to get ahead of the PPE shortage. So we really um, have been okay with medical equipment um, at Baptist, um, and we are still okay with that. As Karen alluded to, at, we were making changes almost every 48 hours as we were gaining new knowledge about the virus, about how we needed to prepare our staff to take care of these patients and what protective gear they needed um, that would best suit them to keep them protected as well. That's great. It sounds like you were very prepared. Um, what about any sort of best practices or are there, are there any collaborative measures with other medical communities or other medical associations within the community? So for a period of time, 
Uh, for a period of time, we had a regional operations uh, group put together. So okay. we, would, we were having similar calls to this, Zoom calls um, between the university and um, St. Joe, Maine and East, and um, Baptist Lexington. And then we also had um, representatives from Baptist Richmond um, and Corbin as well. And so we looked at uh, Central Kentucky as a whole and how we could, we could uh, fight the virus as a team. That's great. As far as best practices, too, I'll say we also shared among hospitals through the Kentucky Hospital Association uh, guidelines for handling visitors, guidelines for uh, safety for employees, recommendations related to quarantine. Those things were handled across the state. So KHA did a good job in that, in that regard as well. That's great. Well, it's wonderful to hear about the collaboration because I do think as, you know, as consumers of healthcare, we all kind of feel like we're in this together and want to make sure that everybody um, is equipped to help care for us should the need arise. Bill, I'll turn it over to you. I know you have a couple of questions specifically as it relates to mental health and another couple topics. I do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that just as much as we all have been told that we need an annual physical, we need at least an annual mental. Uh, I don't know if that's the term that, that you know, um, you all would use, but at the same time, um, l last night I went to my first uh, uh, sporting event uh, in Fayette County. And there are plenty of rules about social distancing and being safe and what we need to do and things like that. But there are just some innate behaviors about sports. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm choosing sports as just one topic. But when I look at it and I watched and I'm sitting six feet away from my mother and uh, I am watching the kids play and they're all having fun and they're doing things like that. And naturally they're, they're not, they're not super susceptible to uh, at least all the symptoms or, or, or the byproduct of all this. I know that there's a mental aspect of this where everyone is burned out and wants to get out and wants to go have fun. So uh, I'm curious where, where is the balance between what we should be doing right now, where we hear Dr. Fauci on TV saying we could go up to a hundred thousand and then people who are just stuck at home. I mean, we, as a group, we all have talked about this before this event, you know, we've got kids and spouses and everyone's at home now. And I've got clients who are pushing back, you know, full time at work schedules right now. So, you know, if, if we look at this, Where's the mental health aspect of this meeting the, the, um, the reality of the transmission of a disease that could hurt people who are in a susceptible condition? And so, you know, uh, Rachel, if you hit that first, I would love to hear your perspective because, I mean, I know some people are going stir crazy right now. Yeah. I, I think when all of this first started, um, we had a lot of people that were really happy. Oh, I get some time at home. I get to, you know, kind of regroup and, and spend time with my family and friends. And as the, the days led into weeks, led into months, um, people kind of started losing some of uh, that, I don't want to say mental stability, but that, that feeling of balance. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think that, life as we knew it before is is for right now is not going to be you know happening but i think that that with some revisions and and i'm sure the kids needed that that interaction that they had with baseball um kids i think we don't think a lot about them because we're so worried about the physical aspect you know we are are social beings you know humans are social and we need that interaction we need that um connection um, and I think that the longer this has gone on, the more distraught people become, the anxiety levels start increasing, the depression starts increasing, uh, liquor sales are probably at their highest they've been in a long time. Um, you know, so I, I think that, that getting, opening it up was, was a very good, um, decision with these restrictions that they put into place. You know, I, I think that if, we remain cognizant of that social distancing. If we remain cognizant of washing our hands and, and keeping our hands off our face and, and you know, uh, gathering safely, um, I, I think that is much needed right now because the mental health of, of not just our, our, our healthcare workers, but everyone involved, that stir crazy is just an overwhelming feeling. Um, and, and with that comes anger comes frustration comes um, 
emotions that, that aren't regulated like they are when you have that balance of that work life sports. So what's the, um, you know, I, I totally agree with you. What are two or three recommendations you might give for people right now that, um, to let that feeling out of um, I'm going, you know, whether it's cabin fever, stir crazy, whatever phrase you want to use, what are some of the things that you're seeing as being positive ways to deal with that? Not only for the adults, but also for, you know, like I've got boys and I, I, I can tell them what to do and make sure they're, they're away. But I mean, there's, there's the adult portion of this. That's our attendees that are here. Uh, watching this today, but I'm, I'm curious also if you've got any guidelines for uh, some of the children that may need to be uh, kind of have creative ways to let some of that uh, cabin fever go. Uh, structure the day. I think that some of the, you know, people need structure and with, with, with everything that's going on, I think a lot of that structure, you know, kids are staying up a little later They're They don't have that school or activities, whether it's sports or, or dance or, or, you know, whatever they don't have that structure so keeping some of that structure uh, getting outside expending some energy I was really happy when the some of the parks and the and the natural you know the the, um, the hiking trails and everything open so I would encourage you to get outside um, you know expend some energy you do some some active games mm -hmm. um, and communicate you know I think that that's the key is is uh, you know if, if you can get the kids involved in something that, that they can, you know, have that social interaction um, at, at, as safe as possible um, because I think it's very much needed. Uh, I would uh, recommend, you know, like, like Karen has spoken, talking about hand washing and the importance of, you know, uh, carrying um, the hand sanitizer with you and, and just kind of reiterating those things with kids and, and, but, getting them out and getting them active mm -hmm. um, and, and keeping that schedule, I think is really important for us to do. I think we have to help people keep this in perspective too. You know, this virus is different than Ebola in the fact that although there are a lot of people that we hear about are either in an intensive care unit or that they are critically ill, there are a lot of people that have managed this, this virus at home and recovered. And um, I think we have to help people understand that a lot of people have not gotten it. Um, and that if they do the things that are recommended consistently, that they're doing everything they can. And if they get it, they're not guilty. It wasn't their fault. Um, and if they expose somebody, as long as they're doing the things that they are, it's not their fault. Um, and so I think people can burden themselves with a lot of guilt. I know I heard somebody the other day say, that, oh, I read it in the paper this morning. It was the golfer, Watley, I think, got it. He called everybody and apologized, you know, and he didn't mean to expose people. He wasn't symptomatic until he lost his taste of, his sense of taste. Um, and he he's a nice guy. He would have never done that on purpose. And so I think we have to forgive people um, if that happens, you know. And then I think one more thing that's important, I was telling Rachel this the other day when we were talking about this presentation, but this opportunity with this virus has been a life changer and it's been so sad for so many reasons, including the financial implications for everybody. But the, the positives, the positives that I've observed are as I am coming and going a little bit from the hospital, I see more families walking and I see couples walking and I see children with parents doing activities outside, maybe that they didn't have time to do before. And I think we will reset our clocks. You know, I think what, whatever our new normal is going to be, I hope will be, the things we really care about doing in the future and not necessarily all the things we always thought we had to do. And I think as yes. a society, we have a good six or eight months to figure that out right now. We, you know, it's interesting. I heard a phrase. Um, I, I don't know if it was on Twitter or where it was. And it says, when are we going to stop calling this working from home? And we're just going to mm -hmm. say we're living at work. And so <laughs> that, that break of being able to get out and do something like, mm -hmm. I, I love the fact that these things are starting to open up. And uh, it's interesting to watch because the organizations that are opening up are tending to have all the precautions in place. Their staff have masks on. They've got the rules and things like that. And I think there's an element that, that is incumbent upon all of the people who are participating at those organizations' events 
to realize that they can't just do anything, but they also have a part in, in being responsible and being respectful of people because a lot of the events are not just for people who are going to be, uh, or typically, you know, not going to be that vulnerable to this, but they're going to be around people either at the event or later that are in a susceptible population. And uh, so it's not just, you know, Hey, that place has their stuff taken care of, but it's, if I go to that place, I need to know my role and my responsibility. I think that's a great segue to, over to Dr. Beckman to talk to us a little bit about masks. And we know that this is a hot topic now, but just kind of remind the group exactly why this is important and, you know, how, how you see this playing out over the next few months. Well, my, uh, my biggest opinion is just wear one, whatever it is, wear one. Um, when I am out and about, I, I do see about 40% of the people wearing a mask. Um, I know that that can be politicized, but it's just being respectful of other people and allowing us to continue to open up and allowing the economy to restart and for us to be able to go to sporting events and participate in things with our friends while social distancing. Um, for the general public, wearing a cloth mask is perfectly acceptable, a bandana, you can cut a t-shirt. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a fancy mask of any kind, although I'm seeing all kinds of things. People are getting mask monograms. I mean, this is an event that hasn't occurred in the world in a hundred years. So um, the fashion uh, industry is taking advantage of it and we're matching <laughs> dresses and everything else. So, you know, wear one, um, mm -hmm. leave a medical grade mask for the healthcare workers. Um, if you can, if you so, have so access I'm sorry, Dr. Beckman, I have a quick question about that. What's the longest surgery that you've been involved in? Oh, I, I do not operate. That's Karen. Karen. Okay. Can, well, oh, no, I'm okay. So, nurse. <laughs> so, so Karen, so Karen, longest surgery in the last say two to three years. Yeah. Um, and you know, a good complicated cardiac procedure can take six or seven hours. All right. Um, and did those people have masks on the entire time? Yes. They people do, but they've been wearing them. Time. Bill, they've been wearing them for years. Yes. That's right. In fact, I was an OR nurse for 15 years, and I wore a mask every day for 15 years. But, you know, the funny thing is when you're wearing it out in public with your clothes on and, you know, you have to, it's just a different, a different feeling. And to see my parents wearing one or my sister, but, yeah, people do it. Well, that, that, that's what, that was my point is that there are people who do, have done this for many years, for many right. hours at a time. Yeah, and, right. and there is a, there's an acclimation period that we have to get used to doing this. But once we get used to doing it, it's not going to be that big of a deal. I used to live in Japan 20 plus years ago and they were doing it then when they thought that they were sick because they didn't want to spread things. It's right. just not as common here. And so if we can get over that hump and say, you know what, I can put up with this for a little while, almost in a, like a train, like I'm training for something, then I think ultimately we can stem this and slow it down. Yeah. So, and, and we have this anticipation that a vaccine is coming and it may or may not be the solid answer to this particular virus. Um, and if it is, that would be wonderful. Um, but it's going to take some time, one, to come up with, with a vaccine, and two, there are, there are millions and billions of people in the world and to reach all of those folks. So this, we could be wearing masks well into the spring of 2021. Um, so it's just, it's something to get comfortable with, like you said. Um, mm -hmm. This virus is spread. Uh, it's a respiratory virus. Um, there is a potential for it to be... Um, entered into the person through the eyes. So wearing eye protection can be um, recommended at times as well. People wear their sunglasses, their, their prescription lenses, um, but that is why we're wearing a mask. People coughing, talking. So even if you're outside and, and you're with a group and you're social distancing, if you're having to yell at people, still keep a mask on if you can, because you can still transmit um, that virus. I saw something posted on social media today that kind of in layman's terms explains the virus. It said, if you're doing crafts with five of your friends and one of them is using glitter, how many people have glitter on their craft? And I thought, well, that's <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> that is the virus, right? That, so if we, That's that true. Sounds very basic, but if anyone's used glitter with their kids or grandkids or with their friends, we know how glitter transfers. Think about it in that perspective. And if we saw glitter everywhere, that we'd wash our hands more, we would wear a mask, we wouldn't touch everything, we wouldn't touch our faces, so. That's, that is a great analogy. And <laughs> along those lines, and I think we all do really need to be very, um, you know, eyes wide open and accept the fact that we are gonna be wearing masks 
for the time being. Do you hear any um, talk of it becoming a mandatory regulated, or do you feel like everyone's still going to be kind of um, making their own good judgment and increasing usage as it as we continue the discussion? I think that's one of those fluid guidelines that's going to change based on the incidents. If there are surges, people are going to do things like they've done in California where they mandate masks. Uh, Dee and I were on a phone call with the mayor today, and she said right now she feels like that that is an enforcement uh, issue and that she's highly recommending it, but she really doesn't want to have to get to the point where she enforces it. Um, but I know in some states where they've had um, increased incidents, I think Miami instituted a mask rule this week. So things things are still going to be fluid well that's a good update current information you know switching gears a little bit uh dr hovermel on the mental health side i know that you've volunteered a lot of your time to try to help uh caretakers both in-home caretakers and medical you know in medical facility to caretakers what can you share with us about that what you've seen over the last few months and and how um how that's evolved and how you've been able to help um, well, nurses and, and healthcare workers aren't aren't real good sometimes of, of filling their own cups uh, until it's to the point where they're at at, at wit's end. Um, so, just I encourage people to use some of the nurses and healthcare workers that I've talked to. I've talked to them about not being so involved in the media, not constantly looking up what's you know what's this or what's that or or, or reading about it and, and, and engulfing their life in this fear um, and I remind them that nurses and healthcare workers we take care of infectious things all the time um, and to keep it in perspective as far as that goes and use your your, your um, precautions that we were taught you know use your hand washing um, take time for yourself you know, make sure that you're, you're doing something for yourself, uh, whether it's taking a walk, reading a book, taking a bath, um, just making sure that you're doing good self-care. And, and Bill had mentioned something earlier about we're, we're living at work. Um, setting time aside, you know, if you're working from home, you know, do it in, a, in one room and that's your workstation. And when you're supposed to get off work, then that's when you leave work setting those boundaries so you don't uh, you're not working all weekend because that's that's where we we tend to lose that balance um and share the wealth if you're feeling frustrated if you're feeling overwhelmed talk to someone reach out you know just remember that you don't have to battle things by yourself and, and talking to someone is a great form of, of mental health relief you know venting just saying i'm frustrated sometimes all i do is listen you know, and that's that's what people need is just someone to listen to, to their fears and frustrations. And then we talk about self-care and sleep. You know, are you sleeping? How are you sleeping? What are you know, what's going on with your anxiety? How are you helping to deal with that anxiety? Is it positive or negative? Um, so just trying to keep that balance um, is really important for not just healthcare workers, but caregivers. You know, if you're at home and you're caring for someone that's home and sick, is, is, is there someone that can help you? Can you take a break? Can you walk outside? What, what can you do to kind of share that wealth so you're not consumed with this illness? I wanted to bring up too, sometimes a source of stress or healthcare issues. You know, people have things that um, are bothering them or that they're worried about. And I can tell you that this is, there's probably no safer time than now to go see a physician or a healthcare provider because people are extremely conscientious mm -hmm. about infection control, really, really careful. And so I think that sometimes um, if you're worried about something or you feel like that you might have a, you know, blood pressure trouble or headaches or something like that, you should not hesitate to go see a, a physician, a nurse practitioner you know, somebody to try to see if they can help you in some way. And we have seen some patients, I think, at all of the hospitals who are sicker because they've put off some of those things because they've been afraid. Yeah. Do, I, so I've got a question that I would love to get all of your opinions on without it becoming political. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear, these cases are rising, and we hear a lot of people say things like, it's not, it's not killed as many people as the flu. We also hear it's rising because more people are getting tested, which does make sense. More people are getting tested. Um, what's your take on exactly where we are? Uh, because 
I have a firm belief um, based on the, I mean, the states that we've seen so far and just my own interpretation, people who didn't lock things down are now seeing the worst effects of that. We see that in Sweden right now, when you look at the infection map in Sweden, because they didn't do certain things, um, you can tell exactly where it is without even knowing where the country's border is Mm -hmm. because of the way that those cases are colored. So I would love to get an, an opinion on the, this, the, the two things. It's not as bad as the flu, hasn't killed as many people. And then the other piece is, you know, where are we really, or do we have enough info to know yet? Like one of the reasons that I personally believe America is as high as it is, it's not just because we've been out going and doing things, it's because we have a population very willing to be tested. So um, I, I'm going to open that one up. And then also before you answer, I will encourage all our uh, guests who are on today, if you do want to use the Q&A feature, we've just crossed the, the point where we've got about um, 10 to 15 minutes left. So if you do have questions for, for our panelists today, please uh, send them in on the Q&A. So with that being said, um, Karen, if you want to start, I'd, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that. Give us two or three minutes on it. Yeah, I will. Um, I think the flu is a very interesting analogy because when you talk about the flu, we have a lot of issues with people who don't take the flu seriously. They don't get a flu shot. They don't wash their hands as well as they are right now. And they (laughs) definitely don't wear a mask when they have uh, opportunities to be exposed to the flu. So I think that there, and there are some people that have developed a resistance to the flu. So yeah, there are people who get the flu and, and it turns into pneumonia and they die. This is a very contagious virus right Mm -hmm. now. And I think you can see uh, that we are very fragile. And when you ask, where are we? It could go either way. You know, if people wear masks and they comply with these expectations, we could see this drop down like they've seen in a lot of the countries and even in New York. Um, If people do not comply and they don't take this seriously, like it's not potentially going to affect them, we could be like Miami. And we have to be really careful it, right now, we do not have control of this. You know, there are a lot mm-hmm. of people that can influence this and personal behavior makes a big difference. So this is a really touchy time right now. And this summer is going to be a good test because it's easy now. It's summer, it's warm, people are outside. This winter when it gets cold and we're dealing with people who maybe think they got the flu, they don't know if they got COVID or not. I worry about that October to January, February time frame when hopefully we'll have a vaccine for this too. Um, So it's a really tough six or seven months coming up here. So earlier today, Dr. Humbaugh uh, from the health department made the statement that um, the cases, overall cases and deaths have more than doubled in the month of June in Fayette County. And one thing people need to remember is most of the time when we're sick, we know we're sick. We don't feel well, we're, we have symptoms. Um, This is a, is a, disease process that a lot of folks are asymptomatic, meaning that they have no symptoms whatsoever, but they're carrying the virus. And so it's an odd situation. Normally you you identify yourself as not feeling well and you isolate yourself from other people, cold, flu, stomach bug, what have you. With this particular virus, folks can be walking around and not have any knowledge that they are positive. That's why when we see folks, more folks getting tested and we have more positives, They had no symptoms whatsoever. They just went and and were tested and came back positive. And that's why it's so important that we continue to wear a mask because we don't know if we're positive or not as we're entering society and everything is reopening. That's a good point. point. Dr. Hovermail, what are your thoughts? Um, You know, being in mental health, I I see the other side too. I I 100% agree that we need to be cognizant of where and whom we're around. We need that social distancing, you know, in, in crowded areas and places that you can't keep that social distancing, make sure that you're wearing that mask. But, but I also encourage to, to not be so fearful that you hide yourself in your house, mm-hmm. that you isolate yourself from your friends and family, that you don't find positive outlets. Um, you know, we, we, we just have to have this, these outlets that, where we can try to be as safe as possible um, because I, I fear that if people kind of, I have a 16 year old and, and he is constantly, you know, on the, the internet reading about it and, and his anxiety level has just expedited. So we're doing a lot of hiking. We're getting out bike riding. We're, you know, anything to kind of get his mind off of that and, to, and still be safe. Um, so I would encourage you to, to be aware 
and be aware that it's highly contagious, but also be aware that, that we can't isolate ourselves from, from people and, and our loved ones because we need them. I'm hearing you say that I need to, I need you to write me a prescription to go ride my motorcycle more there you with, go. A hel with a helmet on <laughs> and away from everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> That's good self care. Yes. Uh, yes. No, but it, it is one of those things that, you know, there, it's, it's tough because there are a lot of people who have opinions right now. We have plenty of social media going on news. You mentioned the anxiety. There are a lot of people who, you know, they're not scientists. They're, they're not from the CDC. They're not physicians. They're not medical health professionals, but they have an opinion on it right now. And, you know, I, I, sometimes they can be swayed, not necessarily because of science or facts, but because of belief. And uh, for me, um, if, if I'm in, the, if I'm in the hospital, I'm thanking the doc because that was a lot of schooling that uh, the doc went through to help me get through or the nurse or the, or, or whatever. You'll have so many acronyms behind your name. I don't know the proper way to actually address you. Uh, but I will say that, that, that I'm believing in that and your advice more than I am, you know, all of these social media things. So from a mental health standpoint, it's almost like I would advise people to just take a break from all the social media. And just t take a breather. Like I think I saw an uh, infographic the other day of how to spot um, not fake news, but um, biased communication yeah. where someone is using certain facts, but not all of them and how to spot bad statistics and things like that. Yeah. Most people of course won't take the time to read that though. It's, it's mm -hmm. a, that sound like culture. And yeah. so for me, I tell my children, I'm like, look, whatever you're hearing, whatever you're reading, just remember to step back, take a deep breath. And if you've got a question, ask me and then we'll go look for the science on it. And I don't know yeah. if that's the right thing to do. Yeah, I'm hoping you're going to tell me it is as a father. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but, yeah. I, but I'm trying to do the right thing because I, one of the things that I am concerned about, you know, my kids and their stress level with this. Yeah, I, I tell I tell, you know, I tell my son all the time, where did that information come from? Mm hmm. You know where where are they getting those statistics? Where are they getting that those those numbers from? Um, and we look at it, and, and I tell him just because it's it's research doesn't mean it's good research. You know what what kind of population are they using? You know is it you know valid? Is it reliable? You know all those things that we evidence based things that we we, we learn. Um, so he's getting crash courses in what's good information and what's not good information because there's a lot of stuff on social media that's not accurate. Right. Um, and, and, and I will say one other thing that we talked about, uh, for those of you who are participants in today's session, uh, this webinar requires people to register to participate. And uh, I think the topic applies to people who may not want to share that they were a part of this from a privacy standpoint. Mm -hmm. So just as a reminder to everyone who's here and also uh, when you get the email response afterwards, all of this goes live. Uh, I'm sorry, it goes online on YouTube. So you can send a link. If you do have anyone that you care about or that you're worried about, you can send them a link to this particular session within the next 24 hours. So if people that you think might want to hear the advice of our panelists today and they just didn't know about it or they didn't register, feel free to send it. It's absolutely anonymous from that point. That's a great point, Bill. And, you know, we have a few minutes left and I think it just might be good to, to kind of wrap up on something really practical and, and maybe Karen, this is for you. But can you tell us a little bit about um, testing uh, that you're offering for COVID-19 and, and what you're doing to encourage people or to kind of, you know, direct people with regard to that who might be interested in getting the test? Yeah, testing is one of the most complicated issues we're dealing with and have dealt with through this whole thing because it's also been evolving. Mm -hmm. um, at, even at the hospital right now, we're using five or six labs for tests. Each one of those has a different turnaround time. We have an immediate test. If we need to know, like a patient's coming in, has a stroke symptom, we'll test them and find out in 15 minutes. We have a limit on those. We have tests that we can get back within 12 hours. We have tests that we can get back in 24 hours, and we have a couple of tests right now that are taking a couple of days to get back. Our physicians have been educated on when is it appropriate to order which test based on the patient's needs. Um, the Kroger testing, the testing that's in some of the pharmacies, um, those things are usually, I think, within 24 hours. They're safe tests, and those tests are for people particularly that do not have symptoms. A lot of the patients just want to know if they have a relative that's feeling weird and they want to go get tested or they're just concerned and want to go sort of have today's peace of mind that they are not positive today, they can go get tested. When you come to a hospital or an emergency room or an urgent care center, 
nine times out of 10, they will probably will not test you if you don't have symptoms because they have a limited number of tests and they want to use them for the people that have symptoms. So that's the difference. I'll tell you the other thing. If you go get tested today and you feel like, oh good, I don't have COVID today, it doesn't mean that you couldn't turn positive next week. And I think that it is a little bit of a false sense of security. Um, now, if you've been exposed and you've waited three or four or five, seven days, and you really want to know if you are positive after an exposure to a relative or a friend, you should go get tested at Kroger's or someplace. But testing is going to have to be ongoing. Right now, even widespread in the country, we're not testing healthcare workers because we could test the whole hospital today, all 3,000 employees, and they could all be negative. But all that means is that today they're negative on a test. It doesn't mean that a week from now or two weeks from now. And so we have to figure out coming in the near future, what is going to be our standard on testing healthcare employees? Because there really is no recommendation right now on that. And, and we want to use the test for patients until we have enough tests. So, so Dr. Hill, I, quick question again. Um, if I want to get my children tested, mm -hmm. should I go to one of the drive through test locations? If, they're, if they do not have symptoms and they have not had a significant exposure, yes, that's what you should do. Okay. Yeah, And there's really no reason to test them unless you're just concerned, Bill, because if they don't have symptoms, 99% they're not going to have it, you know. But if they have symptoms, now I think what people need to realize are what are the symptoms. Um, and I don't, I'll let Dee tell you because she quotes those all the time, but the, the gastrointestinal symptoms are something that's surfaced in the last month or so. Mm -hmm. Even though this is a respiratory virus, there are patients that occasionally will have a GI symptom. So, Dee, do you want to hit those real quick for sure. them and for the viewers? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, we do live in Kentucky. And initially when this started, um, a lot of people have seasonal uh, <laughs> allergies, mm -hmm. which yes. are symptoms uh, of, of COVID-19, um, the novel coronavirus. So you can have a runny nose. Um, you can mm -hmm. have a slight cough. You can have a, a greater cough. You can be short of breath. Uh, just fatigued. You can have a low-grade fever, 100.4. Um, and as Karen alluded to, we've had we've seen more um, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, GI upset, headaches. Um, and one that is unique that we don't see cross over in other illnesses is loss of taste and smell. We've seen quite a bit of that. So, and it's a it's a fast, acute onset. People feel fine, and then. Um, they lose their, tense, their uh, sense of taste and smell. So those are the things to look for. And some of those are very vague and could be um, symptoms of other illnesses. And that's why it's, it's kind of tricky. Yep. Matt, can I say one thing real, real quick? The brain oh. is a very powerful organ. Yes. <laughs> and we, we can talk ourselves into, say you eat something and your belly's upset. You can talk yourself into making yourself sick by worrying. So don't don't rush in if you have a belly ache and say, "Oh, I must have you know, COVID. breathe, relax, and right. see if it it continues." Take your temperature. Take your temperature. Take your temperature. You know that's not a fail proof, but take your temperature. Most of these patients have a little spike in their temperature. Anything over 100.4, you should be a little concerned about. You know, sometimes you may be hot from something. It doesn't mean you have a temperature. Take it again in 15 minutes or a half an hour. But that, that's sort of a good indicator that a normal person can just do at home and see if you have a temperature. Well, thank you all very much for today. We, we've covered a lot. And uh, like I mentioned, this will be live. Uh, or sorry, I keep saying live. This will be recorded on, uh, on YouTube, and it'll be up within at least 24 hours. Um, I, I do want to thank you all very much because I think yeah, it was a great combination of health uh, advice and, and we're trying to cover the whole spectrum of it and also how we may want to look at moving forward across the next couple of weeks and potentially months. It was a wonderful comment about being be prepared to wear a mask even through the winter and what we may have to be prepared for that. So just making people aware, communicating, th this kind of material is great. Um, so as we wrap up today, a couple of reminders, you will receive an uh, email with the link not only to the video, but also to the uh, nomination that Liz mentioned in the beginning. And then if you do have questions, we would encourage you to reach out to your current uh, medical professionals who you have a relationship with. If not, there's always the, uh, you can go to the COVID-19 website that Kentucky has. They do have a hotline where um, 
I've called it once or twice just to see how responsive it is. They've been great in answering questions there. Uh, we, you will get a survey after today, so we'd love to get your comments on today's event. Uh, any, anything that you think we could do that we did well, could do better, some suggestions for future events. And then our next meeting uh, will actually be a webinar on 715, again, starting at four o'clock in the afternoon. So thank you all very much to our panelists. I really appreciate the time that you all have given us today and shared with other people. And uh, with that being said, we are wrapped up for today. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.